Britain and Politics Live. Rishi Sunak faces down his MPs over the Rwanda plan. A deal is agreed at the climate summit. And what are Labour's plans for the NHS? This is Politics Live. Joining me, Conservative MP Miriam Cates, Liberal Democrat MP Tim Farron, Nadine Batchelor-Hunt from Politics Home and Henry Hill, Deputy Ed Editor of Conservative Home, today. The bill has got to work. It's got to get flights to Rwanda and it has got to be acceptable to our Rwandan partners. The Rwanda bill was backed by the Commons last night, but is it just trouble delayed for the Prime Minister? We abstained. But on the very clear understanding that we would then table amendments to strengthen the bill in January. And is the plan to send migrants to Rwanda compatible with Christian values? The principle must stand the judgment of God, and it cannot. It is so decided. <laughs> A deal is done at the climate summit in Dubai, calling on all countries to move away from fossil fuels. And Rishi Sunak will face Keir Starmer at PMQ's Live at Noon. Well, after all the talk of rebellion by Conservative MPs yesterday, uh, the Prime Minister won the vote on the Rwanda plan at second reading rather comfortably. Let's have a look at how the papers have expressed it. Daily Express, victory for Prime Minister. Mutiny over Rwanda plan fades away for now. The Mirror has this headline, a government adrift, the nightmare after Christmas. The Daily Telegraph says Sunak faces down Rwanda rebels. And finally, on the front page of The Times, Sunak survives Rwanda revolt, but it's not over yet. So my opening question for our panel, starting with you, uh, Miriam, is was it a good day for Rishi Sunak? Well, the bill passed, and I think what the vote showed, no, no Conservative MPs voted against at second reading. No. I think that shows that we all agree with the principle of the bill. We want to get the flights off the ground. Uh, we want to make this policy work. So that's what second reading is all about, and I think there was a clear majority to see the bill progress. Um, but as is widely known, a number of us expressed concerns about the practical working of the bill, whether it actually will get flights off the ground or whether we'll continue to see uh, appeals held up in court. Those are our concerns. But our understanding from the government Government is that they're willing to work with us. That's what the next stages are for, to bring amendments, to test those amendments. Uh, and so that's what we'll be looking for in the new year. Tim, was it a good day for Rishi Sunak? Well, he's just delayed the trouble to the new year, as we've just said. I think the policy as a whole is, is a nonsense. Absolute maximum number of uh, refugees it would see deported to Rwanda is 2% of the total. It will dissuade nobody. Just think about it. People who made the crossing across the Channel, they've uh, done that. They've also gone across the Mediterranean. They've gone through the hellhole that is Libya. The thought that there's a you know, one in 50 chance tops of you being deported to Rwanda, the idea that will deter anybody is complete nonsense. £240 million pounds worth of taxpayers' money could have been... That's worth 5.7 million GP appointments. We mm. could have had that with that kind of money. So waste of money won't do what it's said it's going to do. Tory party still not able to resolve whether it wants to break international law or not break international law. And in the end, it's just a distraction from the much bigger issues people are facing, like the fact that, you know, if you're, if you're in my patch, there's a 50% chance if you've got cancer, you're not being treated for two months. And yet this is all smoke and mirrors to stop us thinking about these things. We will talk in depth uh, about the, the detail and the substance. But was it a good day for Rishi Sunak, the Prime Minister? I think, yeah, I think he's delayed it um, until the new year. I think the Mirror's front page, Nightmare After Christmas, feels a bit <laughs> kind of kind of on the nose, but I think quite accurate in terms of what number 10 may be feeling now is that they've got this kind of impossible scenario where on the you know, Tory right, there's unhappiness with the bill not going far enough, and then on the Tory left, there's, um, you know, this is as far as we'll go. How he reconciles those two factions, I think, comes down really to the kind of where the Conservative Party is at ideologically. And going into the next election, maybe we'll see a bit more unity on it when, you know, we're in an election year, people kind of start pulling together. Yeah. But he's got a very, very difficult, um, difficult few months ahead of him. And he really has pinned himself to this policy, which, you mm. know, a lot of people are saying ultimately could prove to be unworkable anyway. Uh, was it a good day for him? 
Yeah, I mean, that's grading on a curve for Rishi Sunak at the moment. But yeah, absolutely. Uh, if he'd lost, it would have precipitated more or less the end of the government. Uh, not Maybe not immediately, but it would have been given all of the all of the political capital he staked on this policy, if he'd then been defeated, it wouldn't have immediately, you know, dissolved the government mm. unless he made it a confidence measure, but his, what's left of his authority would have been gone. So, yeah, absolutely. And I think that Downing Street can... In theory, there is a problem coming up in January because mm. all of these MPs who abstain could vote against it. But on the other hand, like, will they all do that? You've now got another month to try and winnow that group down. That group, I think, at least members of them, will recognise that the, the bill they want won't get through the House of Lords and therefore won't become law before the election anyway. And if they do defeat the government, it could lead to an earlier election when the Tories are 20 points behind the polls. So maybe they'll uh, blink again. Were you surprised uh, by how comfortably it was won that uh, MPs like Miriam, who were unhappy uh, with parts of the, of the bill and how it would work, didn't vote against in the end? I mean, I wasn't necessarily surprised that they didn't vote against because they, they had a strategy, which was, we will uh, table amendments. That was fine. But the margin was surprising, mm. especially given the way the government was calling ministers back mm. and seemed to be doing absolutely everything. It was it was proper 2017 stuff. <laughs> um, and then they won by 44. So. Right. Yeah, well, mm. indeed. Let's talk to the BBC's deputy political editor, Vicky Young. We've been discussing it. Is it just pain delayed for Rishi Sunak? I think it might be. There was certainly a lot of relief uh, last night. I spoke to one cabinet minister who was relieved, but also irritated and they're irritated because they think that they are doing a lot when it comes to uh, dealing with uh, the boats but they think that it's not getting any of the attention this is drawing all the headlines and of course is attracting attention to something that at the moment uh, isn't working but as you say the way that this works you get down to the details in the new year and I think the big question is do they have the numbers, uh, the rebels, uh, on that side to inflict a defeat? I think it's pretty close, pretty tight. And as we know, the problem that the Prime Minister's got is anything that he gives to one side is then going to infuriate the other. And I think, you know, we really have to bear in mind here that the other One Nation Tory group, as they call themselves, you know, a lot of them are really uncomfortable, actually, with the principle uh, of this. Uh, and so he's got to bear that in mind as well. Is there a version, Vicky, of the Rwanda plan that the Conservative Party in its entirety, or pretty well in its entirety, can agree to? Mm, uh, that is a very good question. Is there one that can work, I think, is probably mm. the question, isn't it? And so if you listen to someone like Robert Jenrick, you know, he's convinced, having looked at it for 14 months, that this isn't going to work and it would take an awful lot more. Uh, and to get that into the bill, you're going to lose a huge chunk of other Tory MPs. So, you know, I'm not entirely sure that there is. And I think the other concern for ministers is that they are looking at a group of MPs who are pretty unhappy about lots of things. Uh, they might be unhappy about other things. And, you know, we're getting reasonably close to a general election. And if that is not galvanising people and drawing them together, then really I don't know what else will. And that whole question uh, of discipline is, I think, going to be an issue. And then you look at other issues like taxation, for example, as you then get into the budget scenario, uh, looking at what might come up before the general election, I think there'll be concerns there about whether Tory MPs will actually you know, try and show a bit of muscle around that as well. Vicky Young, thank you very much. Um, Miriam, you're the co-chair of the new Conservatives group uh, on the right of the Conservative Party. You were at the breakfast meeting with Rishi Sunak yesterday. There was no Bre smoked salmon. Bre there was no salmon. Were you disappointed? Uh, with the breakfast? No, <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly, exactly uh, the standard uh, um, for number 10. Listen, so you had breakfast with uh, Rishi Sunak and at that meeting the Prime Minister reportedly told you and others that he's open to the idea of tightening up. I think was the expression, uh, the, the legislation. What did he actually mean? What did he promise you? Uh, well, I'm not going to reveal details of what was a private meeting, but it has been said in public and it was said at the dispatch box that the government is absolutely willing to listen to our concerns and will consider any amendments brought forward. I think the Home Secretary said exactly the same thing uh, on the radio this morning. And so that is, of course, what we're looking for. And just going back to the numbers, though, yes, the government won that vote by a 44 majority. But what that means mathematically is that if 22 MPs had voted the other way, the government would have lost the vote. Sure. And 29 of us chose to abstain because although we agree with the principle of the bill, we are worried that it won't work and we don't want to face our constituents with a third piece of legislation mm. that has failed to stop the boat. So that they, those are the considerations and the numbers and of right. course it's a very difficult calculation for the government. What, what are the significant changes? Are they significant? Um, well, it depends on your point of view, but there are two main practical 
uh, concerns that we have. The first is about the ability to continue to make individual claims against deportation in the mm -hmm. courts, which we think, even if those claims eventually fail, which many of them do, they have the ability to hold up flights for months and months and months. We don't have months. Uh, and the second is about around these Rule 39 orders, which the Strasbourg judges can issue. Uh, and we have concerns about the way that the bill is written on that, that actually it won't have the impact that right. the government says it will and, have. And the Prime Minister's open to that level of change? He has said he's open to negotiations with mm. our lawyers, you know, so we are going oh. to have those discussions. So we have made this decision to back the bill uh, in good faith that those discussions will happen. Well, well, let's just listen to what the Prime Minister actually said, because it doesn't really stack up with what you have just said. Let's have a listen to what he said at the press conference earlier in the week. It is the only approach. Because going any further, that difference is an inch, but going any further would mean that Rwanda will collapse the scheme and then we will have nowhere to send anyone to. And that is not a way to get this going. I mean, it was pretty clear, uh, Miriam. The, 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 there's no going any further uh, because otherwise the scheme will collapse because that's what the Rwandans are saying. Have you been duped? Well, that is only obviously a very short clip. And I think if you look at, I don't know whether oh, it's in it's that statement. Clear. Well, let, let, me, let me finish. Yeah. In that statement, uh, I think whether it's that statement or another one uh, in the House, mm -hmm. the concern seems to be that Rwanda does not want to be part of something that clearly breaks international law. But the bill as it stands mm -hmm. already um, disapplies various aspects of international con conventions. Yeah, but what so I'm trying I to get. Really yeah, but what I'm trying. Right. What I'm trying to get to the bottom of is what the prime minister, even if you won't detail what he said, he was very clear there. They're going no further, and you are saying that he's open to big changes. So when it comes to being honest with your constituents here, I'm saying to you. Are you being played by the Prime Minister or have you secured something that, that we don't know about and we're going to find out about? We're not asking for big changes, as I said. They are we significant asked... changes in lines of what the Prime Minister we, has just said. The government has already disapplied various aspects of international mm. treaties in the first three clauses of the bill. We are asking for that to be extended to the fourth and fifth. In our view, that mm. is not a major change. Fine. Now, how the Rwandans see that, I'm not sure, because right. we have already disapplied those in the first part of the bill. So that's where I don't quite understand uh, this argument. Uh, where do you think, just listening to the Prime Minister and listening to uh, Miriam Cates, where do you think the Prime Minister is on his plan for Rwanda? I think he feels um, that uh, to get Rwanda over the line would demonstrate he's doing something. But the great dishonesty here isn't about whether or not um, Rishi Sunak is being straight with Miriam and her, and her colleagues. The great dishonesty is that this will make any difference whatsoever to trying to stop people making dangerous journeys across the channel. As I said earlier on, they've made far more dangerous journeys to get from the likes of Eritrea and Sudan uh, to get even into mm. France than they would to get here. But do you agree with the principle, Tim, of sending migrants to a third country to have their asylum applications processed? Uh, no, but even if I did, it's not going to make any difference. The 98% the, the you know? uh, minimum of the refugees who come here, we will still be dealing with here. And the fundamental problem we've got is 160,000 people waiting to be assessed. Are mm. they or are they not refugees? The government is... They want to be tough on, uh, on refugees and asylum seekers. Yeah. If they want to have a disincentive, the best thing they can do is get their act together, be competent, assess those people arrive on our shores. If they're refugees, mm. then they're refugees. Yes. If they're not, return them. That actually would be a disincentive. disincentive. This is just a complete distraction. Where do you think uh, the Prime Minister is in these negotiations with MPs like Miriam Cates? Is he just stringing them along or is he going to really face uh, problems in the new year if he doesn't change uh, tack and is open to the sorts of things that she's suggesting? I mean, I suppose in part it depends on how seriously you take this rather strange sudden position by the Rwandan government that after months and months of Britain having this discussion, they absolutely will not allow Rishi Sunak to do anything that he doesn't want to do. Um, but... Rishi's position is essentially that he will lose more votes on the left of his party and in Parliament, I think, if he oh. takes this bill any further, than, if he, than he will gain on the right. So the One Nation group, there were Daily Telegraph before this bill was published, were saying there were 10 ministers from the One Nation wing of the party who were maybe prepared to resign from the government over it. So not disrespective, irrespective of the international law arguments and the, the high principle here, if you're just counting... I don't think there's the votes in Parliament in the Commons for getting a harder bill through, and I certainly don't think there's any prospect of getting that bill through the House of Lords before the election, which means if you do toughen it up, you, you basically, if you're being honest, you have to say our goal here is to have something to campaign on for a year and then fight an election on. You were nodding along uh, to some of that, Nadine. Yeah, I think 
you know, ultimately the, the kind of One Nation group has been forgotten a little bit, I think, in this vote, because they ultimately kind of didn't vote against the government, didn't abstain, they kind of have said, we just won't let it go any further. Mm. That group is still there. And, you know, in January, their, their voices, are, they're going to want to be heard on this. And, you know, I watched a lot of the debate in Parliament yesterday and uh, quite a lot of the Tory moderates were, were essentially quite angry, sounding quite angry about the way that this mm. had, this had um, unfolded and said, you know, we're essentially flying very close to the wind on this. We can't go any further. It could, you know, undermine conservative values. So, you know, I, 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 this, this is what I mean when I say it's kind of an impossible situation for Rishi Sunak. He's mm. kind of promising things and mm. I don't see how he can deliver all of them and get it through the House. Well, you've talked about the One Nation uh, group of Conservative MPs broadly in the centre of the party. Let's talk to one of them. Matt Warman is Deputy Chair of the One Nation group. Hello to you, Hello. Uh, Matt. We've just heard um, from Miriam Cates, a different group within the Conservative Party, saying that the Prime Minister is open. Well, that's what he said uh, to her and colleagues, is open to tightening up the Rwanda legislation. What would your message be in response to that? Well, I think from a One Nation perspective, <coughs> we've been very clear that uh, this bill goes a long way. It puts everyone, Miriam included, uh, in an uncomfortable position, albeit for very different reasons. What we've said is that anything that goes over those vital lines of international law isn't just a red line for us. It's something that risks undermining a whole other chunk of our really important strategy to tackle illegal migration. So I think we need to be uh, careful what we wish for on some of this stuff, but we are united as you saw last night in the vote, mm. around the vital uh, idea of tackling this issue. And everyone compromised a little bit last night. I think that is a spirit that perhaps can persist into the new year. Right. If he does toughen up the legislation and it crosses your red line, what will you do? Well, I think in, pr in theory, we would have to look uh, at precisely what was being proposed. In practice, it's very hard, uh, as the Prime Minister himself has said, uh, to see something that is, uh, by whatever definition uh, people might use, tougher and still within uh, those criteria of, of international law. Because bear in mind, if it does cross those lines, there is no scheme because the Rwandans won't sign up to it. It's not in their interest to be outside that regime uh, and you'll lose those deals with France, with Albania, with Italy, with a whole host of other countries. So as I say I think those are not just red lines for uh, people uh, in some parts of the Conservative Party, they're red lines in the practical effectiveness of this scheme. I mean is it credible that you and your colleagues in the One Nation group would actually withdraw your support, vote against the government if it is toughened up um, in the ways that you have described? Well, no one wants to be in that position. No, no, I and that's understand because... that, but would you do that? Well, I think we'd obviously have to look uh, at what is in the bill, but that's what, uh, in, in what the bill as it would then be uh, amended. But the intention is certainly to vote against any amendments that would uh, push it over those vital lines that would make it uh, unworkable uh, in international terms and would also make it uh, illegal. So I think we have to be uh, very uh, conscious mm. that there are big numbers of people in the middle of the Conservative Party that are deeply uncomfortable already with some of this stuff, but we accept that it is a necessary part of tackling a really important issue, and it is on the right side of international law. So I think we've got to make sure that we uh, continue to have that conversation, we continue to have that uh, compromising spirit so that we can get through this. But we are walking a tightrope, and I think, uh, as I say, everyone is uncomfortable. Right. But you could vote against the whole bill. Uh, I think that is obviously a theoretical possibility, <laughs> uh, but I think that we would have to wait and see uh, what it looked like. But I don't see, and uh, as I say, the Prime Minister has said, he doesn't see a way of doing that uh, so-called toughening that isn't self-defeating and illegal. So mm. I think it seems unlikely that we would get to the position that you describe. Right. I mean, what do you make of the divide in the Conservative Party, Matt? There does seem to be a gulf between you and your colleagues in the One Nation group and Miriam, who is one of five families, as uh, they were described, um, on the right of the Conservative Party. People may just say you're not the same party. 
I, I'm, I'm not sure the mafia uh, connotations really help anybody. <laughs> I, I, th I think look, what we should be doing here, um, I think rightly, is focusing on what happened last night. And what happened last night was people, uh, all of us, as I say, in difficult positions, mm. uh, acknowledge that there is uh, a landing zone that can work and yes. we need to keep up that conversation. So I think it's really important to say that we have a very clear criteria, we have very mm. clear uh, senses that are not just our uh, sense of where we should be, but expert legal <coughs> opinion of, of where we should be in terms of international law. But uh, that compromise last night, I think, is a good sign. I think it can persist, yes. and I think we should be optimistic yes. about getting this done, not just All in right. the interest of the Conservative Party, but in the national interest to tackle this really important issue. Matt Warman, thank you very much. Uh, in the spirit of compromise, um, you uh, we've just heard from Matt Warman, but you have just said Miriam, very clearly there need to be changes made. That spirit of compromise feels like it's going to disappear in a puff of smoke in January. And it's very clear Matt Warman thinks they've got the numbers. They've got more in their group than you have in yours. Well, I think both sides will be bringing amendments. The opposition will be bringing amendments. That's what committee stage is for. But I think there's no point in pretending that there isn't a division in the party. There is. And, and I think uh, Matt and others have highlighted that very well. And the division is this. Which has more status? Law made by this parliament, by 650 MPs that are elected by the British population mm. and that are accountable to that public, or international laws and conventions that don't have any accountability to the British public. Now, I personally think that the highest level of sovereignty, the highest level of law, the highest level of loyalty mm. is the UK and the UK Parliament. I don't think that's extreme position. Well, I, don't, I think that's a pretty moderate position. But those are, the, those are to be clear, yes. the different positions. But you're not in the, in the same family, are you, you and Matt Warman? Because you do, party. you do, but you're <laughs> not in the same family. Things, because on this he, issue, he, that is where the split lies. Right. I mean, is international law supreme or is UK law supreme? Right. That's the clear division. Well, I mean, interna international law isn't supreme. In our, in our constitution, it's very, it's very clear that international law only applies insofar as we've legislated for it. That's why the Human Rights Act has that provision. I think the, the, the slightly strange thing about Matt's position is he's like, oh, well, if we stray over the line of international law, all of our international legal obligations will collapse. Two weeks ago, France just ignored the ECHR and domestic courts to deport a man with terror connections. Joe Biden's White House is yesterday floating the idea of bringing in a border regime that doesn't do refugee checks. So... The, the idea that every, every country has a 100% compliance rate is, is a fiction, which I think is... Wh which side's going to win? I'm sorry to make it reductive. <laughs> well, oh, well, no, I mean, if it comes down to the numbers, I suspect it will be Matt's team mm. that will win because they have more people. Right. I mean, listening to this, um, Tim, uh, when it comes to the discussion on Rwanda at a general election, mm. do you think it is a vote winner? Will it be seen as a vote winner, the plan itself, if it gets through? I don't, it's not a thing that comes up on the doorstep an awful lot. I knock on loads and loads and loads of doors. I'm not saying immigration never gets raised. I think people, when they think of Rwanda, they think of two things. They think either this is a very, very harsh and morally suspect proposal, but mostly they just think it's an expensive and pointless thing that isn't actually going to achieve the thing that the Prime Minister says he's going to achieve. And I, I, I take on this issue of sovereignty. Of course, could, could you get away with it and still remain a member of the families of nations? Yes, I guess so. But sovereignty is really about power. And this kind of reductive discussion about sovereignty, which we've had for the last decade or more now, um, always seems to forget that sovereignty is about power, it's about influence. And the more you become an unreliable partner, the more you become somebody who is seen as um, flouting international law and conventions that we've signed up to, we very often wrote, then we reduce our power, we reduce our sovereignty, we reduce our ability to lead conversations on immigration, on the environment or anything else. I just dispute that. I think power and sovereignty are very discrete concepts, right? We're going, power is actual actual influence and that's an example for example being in the EU do you arguably have more power in some cases there yeah sovereignty is a legal power of absolute decision making but you will pool, but you will often pool sovereignty to have more power can't pool. otherwise can't pool otherwise well we are we're works. in NATO so for example that's not... for example if Russia goes and attacks Poland tonight mm. we're at war that's quite a breach of our sovereignty it's not a breach of it our sovereignty we, we, we would still have to declare it to yes but we would we would still have to declare war because we have a system well, in where case, in that international ever... obligation sure. does not automatically apply in British law because we're sovereign yes so that 
but that's basically saying that every single situation is open for interpretation. Yes, of course it does, but in reality, we reduce our power by being a part of the international community. We have pooled our sovereignty, and these technicalities are the things that used to the Liberal Democrats used to get their knickers in a twist about. The reality is, let's think about what actually affects real human beings. I don't well, want thousands of people taking dangerous trips across the mm. channel. I want to stop that. I don't want a stupid distraction that will do nothing to prevent that at all. Right, well, you've talked about morality. Um, let's continue uh, on that theme, because, as we know, I think, as Nadine and Henry were both saying, it's got to go through the House of Lords. I mean, if it gets through the Commons, it's got to go through committee stage, and then it ends up in the House of Lords. And a prominent critic there is the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby. In his Easter sermon last year, he said the plan, the Rwanda plan, was the opposite of the nature of God. And he's gone on uh, to <coughs> criticise the government's approach in the Lords. Um, Miriam... You wrote this in response uh, to those comments on your website. It's not unchristian to control our borders. We don't have a moral duty to allow uncontrolled migration into our country. Um, why is Justin Welby wrong? Uh, well, I actually wrote that for the magazine Unheard. It's on my website as well. Um, why is he wrong? Because I, I, I don't like <laughs> criticising the Archbishop mm. in public, but... I do think he's <laughs> wrong, but private. I have, yeah. uh, so I'll continue. Um, but I do think he's wrong on this, and the reason for that is, I abs of course, you know, the teachings of Jesus, the teaching of the Bible, the teaching of many religions are about uh, personal uh, love and sacrifice to your neighbour, compassion to those in need. But I don't think those teachings of Jesus in this case were about government policy. And I think that governments have a duty to make law, have boundaries that keep people safe and enforce those boundaries. And actually, you know, the, the Jewish law that was laid down in the Old Testament was very much about boundaries and how to create a safe society and what happens if you stray. And I think we do need boundaries. They have to be strong and governments have to legislate for the general, not the individual. It's up to us as individual human beings to show those values and those virtues of love and compassion to individuals rather rather than guiding government policy in any particular way. Well, Tim, you wrote something uh, completely different, of course. You agree with uh, Justin Welby broadly in the Christianity uh, magazine. The illegal immigration bill is shameful. Christians must stand against it because you say Christians should be most committed to human rights and there are many instructions in the Bible to help the stranger or the foreigner and to love our neighbour. Familiar to many people. Yeah, I mean, where to start? If there's no God, there's no human rights. It's just an invention of human beings. They're fashionable and they're passing. They won't be human rights in a decade. If the, for, so there must be a metaphysical for human rights to mean anything at all. But secondly, more importantly, I do agree it's perfectly legitimate for Christians to take different views on what you do with regular migration. Open door, closed door, somewhere in between. Mm. Absolutely legitimate to take different um, interpretations. I cannot read the Bible and come to any other conclusion that you must behave in a very different way towards the refugee. And, and that is what we're talking about here. And love in the Bible, many talks about sacrifice, is always costly. It's not soppy, it's not sentimental, it is costly. Does it cost us to do the right thing by people who could be in our position, mm -hmm. to love our neighbour? And our neighbour is anybody and everybody, by the way. There are no qualifications, you know. And so do, how, how do we respond to the refugee? And the, the answer is, we must first of all establish whether they are a refugee, which is what the government's failing to do, and then we must put ourselves in our position. How would, let's say Britain was a total and utter war-torn basket case, and Eritrea was a safe place. Mm -hmm. How would we want the Eritreas to treat us and our family if in they were in our position, and that's the answer to your question. Uh, just before I come to you, Dean, what do you say to that, Miriam? Well, I, I have huge respect for Tim, and he's someone I very much look up to in, in politics and in faith. Um, so, you know, I don't enjoy disagreeing with him, but I do, I do take a different position on this, which is I don't think it is our role as individuals to show love. I don't think a government is a moral entity in the oh. same way, and I think the government has to pass laws that keep its people safe first and foremost. That is the responsibility of the government, rather than being an individual moral agent. Is this an issue of morality, um, or is it government policy which takes it outside, I in a way, certainly the, the religious discussion? I mean, I'm Jewish. You mentioned um, Jewish law, but um, one of the things that I, I keep seeing, because there's a, some ha unhappiness in the Jewish community among leadership with this policy as well, and one of the things um, at mm. Passover we say, you know, I remember uh, you should be you know, kind to the stranger because remember you were once strangers in mm. Egypt. So I think, you know, when it comes to, to refugees, because there's such a kind of, you know, religious, many religious connotations to it, it will always come up as a moral issue. I think ultimately the government are going to struggle to shake off moral criticism of this. I think, you know, there'll be people that say this policy could deter people crossing and therefore it could ultimately save mm. lives. I mean, 
I remember when this policy was announced and we, we asked, you know, in lobby, where's the evidence that this policy is going to work? Mm -hmm. There isn't actually any evidence at the moment that it will work, but that's, you know, that the, the government say that's not to say it will never work. Um, but I think the kind of ethical um, ethical element of it is always going to be a struggle. And I think it was interesting yesterday, Keir Starmer mentioned that, um, that Labour would, would kind of reverse any Rwanda legislation, not just uh, because they don't think it would work, but also it, because he said it's against Labour values. So I think the ethical argument is just going to be an unavoidable uh, consequence of a policy which seeks to deport potentially vulnerable people to a, to a third country for processing rather oh. than processing here. Yes. No, and I think, you know, that they're, of course, all fair arguments that I completely respect. But just to come back to this idea of the difference between the general and the individual, of course, let, let's take prisons for an example, an obvious example of, of you know, the justice system in action. Mm. We all have huge compassion for many people who end up in prison. We know that people uh, who are brought up in care, who, you know, have got all sorts of other problems, disproportionately end up in prison. There's no reason why we shouldn't feel compassion for those people and that faith groups, voluntary groups, shouldn't go into prisons and help those people and help them re-establish themselves in society. 100% agree. Should the government stop sending people to prison? No, because in a, in a, in a safe society, we need boundaries and they must be enforced. Those are the difference between the responsibility of the individual and the duty of the government. And I think that's really where this disagreement lies. Honestly, I think that there's, there's, there's the issue about morality, about how one treats refugees. Maybe the biggest moral issue in this discussion is truth. We're in a situation where 86% of refugees seek refuge in the country next door to the one they fled from. An ever-decreasing trickle end up at this island at the edge of the Atlantic. Mm. We take a third as many refugees as France, a quarter as many as Germany, and compared to the rest of the European Union, other parts of the European Union, we're 18th in the league table. So, the, is this a challenge? Yes. Should, should they... Are we being swamped? Yeah. Absolutely not. Well, so is there be, a limit? What people want to say is the there a limit on how many people the UK should and can take? Constituents might want to know that. Well, so look at where we are now. We got what have six hundred thousand sort of net migration last year. Ninety plus percent of that was controlled migration. So the issue is, have yeah. the government got the right policies? And I think the Conservatives' major problem is this: they believe immigration is a unpopular and b vital to our economy, and they can't square the two. Right. Because they, so they'll, so they'll <laughs> yeah. talk about it, right. but they will not fix it because they know it would screw the economy. What, what, what about the morality, um, as Miriam was expressing, which is that a government's first duty is to uh, the constituents and voters here in the UK? Yeah, sure, we do need to do that. But we're, when, if we're talking about the morality of it from a Christian perspective, as I say, all love is costly. So the fact that looking after refugees will cost us is, is a thing that I absolutely accept we will need to do. But to go back to my initial point about whether it's fine to disagree about these things, when it comes to regular migration, absolutely, it's fine to have a disagreement. And it may be that we need more or we need more or less regular uh, refugees or, uh, sorry, mi migrants coming through different routes. Right. But let's remember, refugees have been, are now and will always be a relatively tiny minority of the overall numbers who come into our country. Right, certainly on the illegal uh, migration side, as the government uh, Well, they call it illegal. illegal. I don't think yes, there's anything well, as, illegal as the gov refugee. As the government uh, calls it. Yeah. But generally, I mean, <laughs> we're talking about... Christian beliefs and whether this policy is compatible. Uh, but what do you make of the discussion that Tim and Miriam are having in terms of first duty is to whom? Well, I mean, my view is that it, it, the, you know, the primary covenant of any nation is to its citizenry, because that's the, that's the point of what citizenry is. That's why you make it a defined group of people. Otherwise, the government is essentially just a sort of universal dispensary with a specific tax base attached to it. I mean, on, on, the, on, the, on, on the basis of, uh, of the Christian stuff, I mean, I, I'm a traditionalist. I like having bishops in the House of Lords. But it, do. does, it does necessarily mean that you are inviting them to speculate yeah. on that, which is properly Caesar's domain, right? Um, so right. the you know, G, uh, Jesus. You'd said, rather not hear from uh, Jesus Justin said, "Render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's," <laughs> and in in this case, that which is Caesar's includes border policy. Now then, that's a really important because so <laughs> what does Jesus say? He says, oh. "This belongs." So give to Caesar what is Caesar's, give to uh, what is God's, what is God's. Well, and the point is, on that crown, mm. on that that coin, was an image of Caesar. So you give your cash, or you give your you know your your daily sort of fealty to the to the government, but. You bear, the, but you bear the image of God, so you give yourself to him. And oh. that means, you're, and that's why I say from a Christian perspective, if you're trying to fit your faith around your politics, you've gone the wrong way. Well, you and it was difficult, and of politics. course it was difficult for you personally, wasn't it? When sure, you were but, in... you, but you seek to shape your, fate, your politics around your faith. And that's the bottom line, because in the end, I bear the image of God and I bear ultimate allegiance to him, and therefore to Would all you... the human beings he's created, all whether right. I like them or well, not. Well, the lesson, <laughs> the lesson from Tim Farron, uh, there, just very briefly, <laughs> <laughs> Should Justin Welby not talk on these sorts of issues? It's a really difficult one. I mean, 
Yes or no? I, I think... Well, I don't have a yes-no answer. I have a, a, a two answers in my mind. Firstly, they're in the House of Lords. That's our constitution. Right. They are political by definition, so yes. But on the other hand, the bishops have voted against the government 98% of votes this, this parliament. They're not if neutral. The, if the government wanted to complain about that, they should have reversed Gordon Brown's decision Indeed. to get themselves out of the appointment right. process. Well, on that note, no, no, because we've got to talk about other worldly, <laughs> other worldly <laughs> issues. <laughs> um, and we're going to talk mind. about COP28. Uh, let's have a look at this headline. COP28 deal pledge global transition away from fossil fuels for the first time. You heard there in uh, the headlines. <coughs> and what the deal doesn't do is say that fossil fuels will be phased mm. out, which was the terminology we discussed yesterday. Uh, let's speak to the BBC's correspondent who's in Dubai, Carl Nassman. Hello to you, Carl. What has been agreed on today? Yeah, there is a lot in this deal. It's not everything that everybody wanted, but the headliner is what you mentioned, a transition away from fossil fuels. There are some other agreements here calling for nations to triple their renewable energy capacity, to double their energy efficiency. There's some more vague language about promising to reduce methane emissions. So there really is a lot in there that will help the world get back on track for 1.5 degrees Celsius. And we shouldn't forget about the big progress that was made at the very beginning of this summit. Uh, on the first day, the loss and damage fund was finally launched after 30 year fight by uh, many nations on the front lines of climate change. That's a fund designed to uh, give monetary assistance to countries recovering from damages from climate change. You know, COP28 President Sultan al Jaber, he promised an ambitious COP28. He wanted a big deal. He said he wanted to bring everybody to the table from oil companies to oil nations. He said he wanted to keep 1.5 degrees alive. In hearing his speech after he gaveled in that agreement, I think he's pretty happy with the outcome here in Dubai. Um, Carl, just briefly, it's been hailed as a landmark deal because it's the first time countries have agreed to move away from fossil fuels. But there's no time scale, is there? I mean, it, it still feels quite voluntary um, at this point. I, I, is that the case? Many of these deals at these climate summits are, are voluntary. Very few countries have any mechanisms for enforcement. It, it comes down to the court of public opinion. It comes down to naming and shaming countries that aren't doing what they said that they would do. What you will hear, though, from, from developing nations here is that this deal isn't quite enough for them, that if they're going to be asked to transition away from fossil fuels, they need more assistance. They need more money to do that. I spoke with the uh, energy minister of Uganda, and she flat out said, look, we want to continue burning fossil fuels. Our economy can't afford to just move away uh, right away. Of course, there are no uh, exact time limits. But they said we need more assistance. We need more help with adaptation to the effects of climate change that we're already seeing now. And we saw impassioned speeches even after this deal was agreed from <coughs> nations like Samoa saying this isn't enough for us. All right, Carl Nassman there in Dubai. Thank you very much. How big a moment do you think this is in terms of the commitment to climate change? Or fighting it, I should say. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's obviously significant, you know, it's the first time we've seen this sort of language used, but ultimately the problem is extremely pressing and a lot of people would say the lack of the, a deadline there, um, the, it, the, the kind of reluctance to use the word phase out, um, you know, those are kind of, a lot of climate campaigners would say it's a bit of a loss because ultimately we are looking at, like, you know, massive scale ecological damage, environmental um, damage, and um, this is about our future. I mean, you know, but small victories, and, you know, it is right to say that the kind of fund that was established at the start of COP28 is significant, mm. will be significant mm. for a lot of smaller countries. But I also, also think it's interesting, you know, uh, what your correspondent there said about Uganda. It is often these kind of developing nations mm. who are kind of getting on their feet, seeing that economic growth, that are being asked to decarbonise, that are going to struggle with with it the most. I mean, even here, we've seen some kind of rowing back on some of our mm. net zero commitments. So I think, you know, it just goes to show it's a very complicated issue that has, you know, wide-reaching political consequences. I guess there has been, a, has been a small victory there, but ultimately, a lot of people are going to say it's just not enough, given the scale of the crisis we're facing. Uh, and are we meeting uh, the commitment, as it's been announced? Um, this is the Daily Telegraph headline. Oil and gas licences to be sold every year under Rishi Sunak's new law. How is that compatible with moving away from fossil fuels? Uh, well, one, because oil is used for plastic and we're always going to need plastic, but two, because we actually have a... Tran the transition is going to take time and that time we're going to need oil and it's better our oil than oil from Russia or Saudi Arabia, right? So 
that's actually a perfectly sensible decision. The big picture problem, as you've just said, is that countries are not going to vote, especially developing countries, are not going to vote to kneecap their economic development. They're not going to forego methods that we use to become wealthy and let their own people suffer. So the, the, the most important thing for combating climate change is developing and then helping those countries to develop green technologies, like small modular reactors that we're developing in this country. If that technology can be brought to maturity, we should be just pumping it out to the world so that they can use it. That's how you make the difference not just demanding that countries much poorer than us uh, do you, make sacrifices we didn't. I mean, do you think the UK and the UK government is in certainly the spirit of those words moving away from fossil fuels when they've just announced they are going to continue uh, having licenses for oil and gas exploration? I mean, we're, we're limping in the right direction, but not with the kind of urgency and pace that we need. And the you know, Prime Minister's... Um, uh, comments and, and policy direction changes on, on net zero in the last few months all seem to be about winning tomorrow's headlines rather than securing our children's future and that worries me deeply and um, and also remember we have a leadership role and we don't have much leverage if we end up not doing the right thing here at home so why are we not investing in tidal energy why are we not having a, a genuine green industrial revolution but absolutely that is right that we've got so many countries out there who see we and the rest of the west got wealthy by going through our dirty phase why do we have to um uh, not why, can, why can't we do the same mm. thing which does mean there's gonna be a level of justice and uh, and redistribution that we've got to help them with that green technology but the impact on planet the planet and the people on the planet over the next of the coming decades could be absolutely catastrophic which is why this is a step in the right direction, but not quick enough and not enough. Well, on the leadership question, not just Tim Farron uh, saying that there isn't enough leadership from the Conservative government. On BBC Radio 4's PM yesterday, the Conservative peer, Lord Deaton, said the UK's given up uh, leadership on climate issues. Do you agree with him? No, not at all. I think the UK has gone further and faster on net zero and decarbonising and reducing uh, emissions than almost any other Western nation. And I think, you know, we have received a lot of praise for that. But we've also got to be honest, we account for only 1% of the globe's emissions. If, if Britain ceased to exist today, it would make almost no difference uh, to world emissions. And China would fill, would fill that 1% within months. So I think we have to be realistic about what we can achieve. And so that's why I think Tim's right. Our role is about technology. It is about developing the kind of technologies that could give developing countries the same kind of cheap energy that we have enjoyed and is inextricably linked to prosperity. Cheap energy is absolutely the foundation of our economy. Yeah. And so I think that is our... <laughs> bills aren't going down anytime no, soon, No, they're not. They? And that's no. because, unfortunately, I do think, although in theory some of the renewable energy technologies we have and are developing will lead to cheaper energy in the future, they haven't now. And onto the f fossil fuel point, 40% of our energy mix is gas. We are going to need fossil fuels for a long time, hence. So it's much better to extract those fossil fuels here, mm. where we can do it in a greener way and receive uh, money well, for the Treasury but than it is to import it and pretend uh, that we are not... <coughs> still, that it will not. still be imported and prices of oil and gas are set by international markets. So this no, is I'm one talking of the about that... the re revenues for the Treasury. I'm not saying it will necessarily affect <coughs> prices. I'm <coughs> saying at least, you know, we've got it, we can produce it. Right. I mean, let's just show you this headline. I mean, talking of leadership, I mean, mm. actions matter, don't they, Miriam? BBC News Climate Minister Graham Stewart makes 6,824 mile round trip from Dubai back to the UK for the vote on Rwanda, which wasn't actually necessary for him to come back, and then went all the way back to Dubai. I mean, what signal does that send? Well, it signals a send that, that, first and foremost, government is about voting, and that of, uh, MP's first duty, if I mean, called on, is to vote. You, you, know, you, can pick on, waste. You, you can pick on that example and say this is hypocrisy. But uh, this is, you know, fundamental to the debate is we have to be practical. People do have to use planes. People do have to switch the lights Operation, on. I'm not, I'm not convinced. The hair shirt was, was sent up by Yes Minister in the 80s, and yet we still I'm get not, headlines I'm not convinced like the issue there is about the flight. People have got to get there. He's going to come back at some point. The, the point I... I mean, I'd have paired with him, for pity's sake, mm. because having somebody who was there... And well. I'm, I'm, I'm proud to vote against the bill last but, night, but if it would have meant we actually had a minister at COP28 yeah. to show leadership, I'd have sat on my hands to allow him to stay away and do the right thing. Well, right. that's a very fair point, and I don't know whether the wits tried to do that or not. Yeah. Who knows? But I think that's a very fair point. But I think we just need some realism in, in this debate. And on things like, you know, electric vehicles, yes, they're part of the mix, but are they the whole answer? Will we ever have enough grid capacity? Are we really sure about the batteries oh. and the safety you know we've got to be honest about this debate it's not black 
of new what? pylons and a small modular reactor in your constituencies? Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm for more <laughs> modular reactors. Oh. I, tell you, I tell you what I'm also for, though, is, is Great Britain doing what we should have done years ago and invest in tidal. We've got the second biggest tidal range on planet Earth after Canada. We use next to nothing, the, uh, next to none of it. And the, the technology exists. It's well, mostly British. And that is a future where we really would have cheap, available, renewable energy. And some of it is energy, about certainty literally well, here. Yeah. Certainty. The tide I, never stops. I think we could, got the moon, <laughs> it's there. <laughs> I think we've got time just to look inside uh, the chamber because everything will be filling up. It is the last uh, Prime Minister's questions before the Christmas recess. Um, we'll be going to uh, PMQs in just a few minutes' time, but I have some breaking news for you, uh, which is this, the BBC headline, Wales's First Minister, uh, Labour First Minister, Mark Drakeford resigns. Yes, he has made the announcement today. We did know that he wasn't going to serve or stand again in the next Senate uh, elections in uh, Wales in 2026, but let's have a listen. I'm here to tell you that I have today formally notified the chair of the Welsh Executive Committee of my intention to stand down as leader of Welsh Labour in March of next year. Uh, when I stood for the leadership of the Labour Party in Wales, I said that if I were to be elected, I would aim to serve for five years. And exactly five years have passed to the day since I was confirmed as First Minister in 2018. So, announcement there by Mark Drakeford. Briefly, reaction from the two politicians. We may interrupt to go into Prime Minister's questions, but briefly. I mean, a, a, a dutiful man who did a good job in difficult circumstances without any kind of flap or sensationalism. And, and, I, and it's been a really tough time for him. He lost his wife very recently. Mm, he did. Um, and so, you know, for his sake, I'm, I'm glad he's going to get um, a retirement. I hope he mm. does. But I think he's done, a, he's done a decent job and has contrasted maybe with some people who've exercise leadership in a, in, a, in a less dutiful and a more showy way. Worst well. school performance in the UK, just worth putting that in. What, the worst what? He, Wales has the worst school performance oh. in the UK. <laughs> what about just you, Miriam? Saying he's doing a good job. Um, well, I, I echo what Tim said, of course, you know, I don't agree with him politically, but he has served faithfully and he's kept his promise. Ah, mm. well, of course, important yeah. in politics, isn't it? Uh, we're talking uh, uh, of which, I think we're almost time to go into the show. And Lindsay Hoyle is back as speaker. Here's PMQs. Mr. Speaker. As, uh, as it's the last... As the last Prime Minister's question before recess, I know the whole House will want to join me in wishing you and all the House staff a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And I know members will also want to join me in sending our warmest wishes to our armed forces, both at home and stationed overseas, and our emergency services, and all those who will be working over Christmas too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And finally, I know everyone will want to join me in wishing Mark Drakeford all the best yeah, as he moves yeah, on from his many, many years of devoted public service. Mr Speaker, this morning I had ministerial meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Can I concur with the comments of the Prime Minister about our armed forces, Christmas and Mark Drayford? My constituent, Mr Speaker, um, Fred Bates, is 74, he has liver cancer and he's a victim of the contaminated blood products scandal. The Prime Minister had a chance to do right by Fred last week, but failed to do so and lost the vote in this House. After half a century, Fred wishes to know when he and fellow survivors will be compensated and get justice. Yeah. Now, Mr Speaker, this was an appalling tragedy and my thoughts remain with all those concerned. I absolutely understand the strength of feeling on this. It was this government previously who set up the inquiry, which I participated in, and we fully understand the need for action. The government has crucially already accepted the moral case for compensation and acknowledged that justice does need to be delivered for the victims. My right honourable friend, the Minister for the Cabinet Office, will update the House on our next steps on the infected blood inquiry shortly. Greg Smith. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The tax cuts in the autumn statement were extremely welcome. Yeah. 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 But in order to go further and to get the tax burden as low as it possibly can be, accurate and robust economic modelling is required. The Office of Budget Responsibility have been habitually wrong, and we had the spectacle last week 
of the head of the OBR saying that his latest forecast might be 30 billion out. So will my right honourable friend commit to finding a better system of financial modelling so we can get taxes lower? Well, Mr Speaker, as my honourable friend knows, uh, the OBR has brought greater transparency and independence to the forecast in which government policy is based. But it, he's right, and it is required to produce an assessment of its accuracy of its fiscal and economic forecasts at least once a year. But crucially, as he acknowledged, thanks to our management of the economy, the fact that we have halved inflation, control borrowing, we now have delivered the largest tax cuts in a generation, Mr Speaker, and they will benefit families up and down the country from January. Welcome the Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starmer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Yesterday we heard of the tragic death of a young man on the Bibby Stockholm. I know the whole House will want to send our deepest condolences to his family and friends. We must never let this happen again. I would also like to mark the retirement of my colleague and friend, Mark Drakeford, the First Minister of Wales. Mark committed his life to public service and lives his values every day. Quietly and patiently, Mark has been a titan of Labour and Welsh politics, and we thank him for his service and wish him well. Mr Speaker, Christmas is a time of peace on earth and goodwill to all. Has anyone told the Tory party? Mr Speaker, Christmas, Mr Speaker, Christmas is also a time for families, and under the Conservatives we do have a record number of them, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, but it's important. A year, at the beginning of the year I set out some priorities that this government would deliver for the British people. And over the course of this year we have, Mr Speaker, inflation halved, Mr Speaker, the economy growing, debt falling action on the longest waiters, the boats down by a third, and crucially, as we heard from Honourable Friend, tax cuts coming to help working families in the new year. Mr Speaker, he can spin it all he likes, but the whole country can see that, yet again, the Tory party is in meltdown and everyone else is paying the price. Now, he's kicked the can, he kicked the can down the road. But in the last week, his, his, MPs, his MPs have said of him he's not capable enough, he's inexperienced, he's arrogant, a, a really bad politician. Well, they're shouting, this is what they said. So, well, come on, come on. Who's, who was it who said he's a really bad politician? Hands up. <laughs> they're shouting. Well, what about inexperienced? Who was that? Or, and now there's got to be some hands for this, he's got to go. Oh, shy. Apparently, he's holding a Christmas party next week. Order! Order. It's Christmas. No, the (laughs) Christmas... But you might not want the Christmas present that I could give you, so please, be a slumber. Apparently, he's holding a Christmas party next week. How's the invite list looking? (laughs) 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 Mr Speaker, I I, I thank the uh, Honourable Gentleman for all the comments. Uh, What I would say to him, he should hear... He should hear hear what they have to say about him, Mr Speaker. Right. Do you want to be the first one? Because it is Christmas and I'm going to hear it. My constituents are going to have a Christmas like everyone else. They want to know how their Christmas is going to be affected. So I want less of it from all sides. Keir Starmer. They've obviously found the donkey for their nativity. The search search of three wise men may take a little longer. Uh, But while they fight amongst themselves, there's a country out here that isn't being governed where more than 100,000 people are paying hundreds more a month on their mortgages. Energy bills going back up in January. The economy shrinking again. NHS waiting lists an all-time high. Doesn't he think the government would be better off fixing the messes they've already made rather than scrambling to create new ones? 
Mr. Speaker, he talks about governing and spent the first two questions talking about political tittle tattle, Mr. Speaker. Well, let's get on to the substance, Mr. Speaker. Let's get on to the substance. He mentioned the things. What is the news that we've just heard in the last week? Well, what's the most important thing? The most important thing is education, Mr. Speaker, because that's how we spread opportunity in our country. And what have we yeah. learned? Where are the schools performing best in the United Kingdom? In England, Mr. Speaker, thanks to the reforms of this Conservative government, rising up the league tables, giving our kids the start they need. And where are they plummeting down? In Labour run Wales. He, he talks about children. Nearly 140,000 children are going to be homeless this Christmas. That is more than ever before. That's a shocking state of affairs, and it should shame this government. Instead of more social housing, house building is set to collapse. Instead of banning no-fault evictions, thousands of families are at risk of homelessness. Rather than indulging his backbenchers, swanning around in their factions and their star chambers, pretending to be members of the Mafia, when's he going to get a grip and focus on the country? Let's just look at the facts. Let's look at the facts, actually, because rough sleeping... Rough sleeping in this country is down by 35%, Mr Speaker, since it speaks, thanks to the efforts of this government. There are hundreds of thousands of fewer children in poverty today, thanks to this government, Mr Speaker. And when it comes to home building, again, what are you doing? We just had the data this last week. In the last year, an almost record number of new homes delivered, Mr Speaker, more than in any year of the last Labour government. 140,000 children homeless this Christmas, and he's utterly tone deaf. Yes. And the rise in homelessness shows how these Tory crises merge and grow and damage the country. Yes. Families like the Bradys in Wiltshire, both parents working full time with two young children, forced out of their home of 15 years by a no fault eviction, now living in their van. Or 11 year old Liam Walker, homeless this Christmas. He wrote a letter to Santa saying, please can I have a forever home? I don't want any new toys, I just want all my old toys out of storage. I just want us to be happy again. Is there anything that could shame this government into putting the country first? Then it's surely this little boy. Mr Speaker, if you really care about building homes, if he really cared about building homes, when, when there was an opportunity in this House, exactly. Mr Speaker, in this House to back our plans to reform defective EU laws, to unlock 100,000 new homes, Mr Speaker, what did he do? What did he do? He went in front of the cameras and said one thing and came in here and blocked it. Typical shameless opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As the world. Oh, Mr. Speaker, is that really his Christmas message to Liam? Cocooned in his party management breakfast. He just can't see the country. Order, order. Mr. Cleverley, please. It's Christmas. I want a little bit of silence. And I'm, I'm going to get it one way or another. And that goes to each side. Here's Starmer. Cocooned in his party management breakfast, he just can't see the country in front of him and what they've done. I'll finish by thanking hard-working families across Britain who kept our country going. It's been an impossibly difficult year for so many. I want to pay special tribute to our key workers, particularly those in the emergency services and those serving abroad in our forces, who, even at this time of year, are doing the vital work of protecting their country. I wish everyone, including the members opposite, a very happy and peaceful New Year. Will the Prime Minister join me? Prime Minister. I think, I think, I, I think Mr Speaker, he, mi- he, missed, he, mi- he missed that I paid tribute to our emergency workers at the beginning of the session, Mr Speaker. But let's see, no, because I think it is important, because he talked about working families. Of course, Mr Speaker, I want to make sure that we support working families, and that's what we're actually delivering, Mr Speaker, because all he has to offer them is borrowing £28 billion a year. 
which all it will do is push up their mortgage rates and push up their taxes. Meanwhile, what have we done? Delivered tax cuts for millions of working families, boosted the national living wage, Mr Speaker, recruited 50,000 more nurses, 20,000 more police officers, improved our schools. We've cut the cost of net zero for those working families. We've cut the boat crossings by a third and we've halved inflation. And that's the difference, Mr Speaker. We're getting on and delivering for working Britain. Stephen Hammond. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As the world struggles to agree the future of the 1.5 commitment, in Wimbledon we're keen to do our bit. So, to help my campaign to make EV charging access more widespread, can I ask my right honourable friend for two early Christmas presents? Will he speak to our right honourable friend, the Chancellor? to ask him to look again at the unfair differential rates of VAT yeah, on public yeah. and private charging points? Yeah, yeah. And will he ask our friend, <coughs> our right honourable friend, the Levelling Up Secretary, to look at the bylaws that stop local councils making on-street parking and charging more accessible? Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, I'm happy to tell my honourable friend that the Chancellor has already uh, authorised over £2 billion of investment to support our transition to zero emission, emission vehicles, and we are well on track to reach 300,000 charge points by 2030. And I can also tell him that we will consult on amending the national planning policy framework to make sure that it prioritises the rollout of charge points on top of the funding of almost £400 million to support local authorities spread these out so all our families have access to them when they need. SNP leader Stephen Flynn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can the Prime Minister please share his Christmas message for children being bombed in Gaza this winter? Yeah, yeah. Prime Minister. No. Mr Speaker, nobody wants to see this conflict go on for a moment longer than necessary. We urgently need more humanitarian pauses to get all the hostages out and to get life-saving aid into Gaza to alleviate the suffering of the Palestinian people. And we have been consistent that we support what is a sustainable ceasefire, which means Hamas must stop launching rockets into Israel and release all the hostages. Mr Speaker, if the current actions of the Israeli government continue, then it is estimated that almost 1,400 more children will die between now and Christmas Day. Now, in the United Nations last night, our friends and allies in France, in Ireland, in Canada, in Spain and in Australia they joined with 148 other nations to vote with courage, care and compassion for a ceasefire. The UK, they shamefully abstained. How can the Prime Minister possibly explain why 153 nations are wrong, yet Westminster is right? Mr Speaker, as I have said consistently, we are deeply concerned about the devastating impact of the fighting in Gaza on the civilian population. Too many people have lost their lives already, and this is something that we've stressed, and I've stressed personally to Prime Minister Netanyahu just last week. And what we are doing practically is to get more aid into Gaza, Mr Speaker. The Foreign Secretary is appointing a UK humanitarian coordinator, and in my conversations last week with Prime Minister Netanyahu, I pressed him on opening up the Karem Shalom crossing so that more aid can flow in, and we are actively exploring the opportunity for maritime corridors, something that the UK is well placed to lead, and I can give him my assurance that we will work night and day to get more aid to those who desperately need it. Dr Neil Hudson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. We expect our young folk to remain in educational training until they are 18, but many lack transport to get there. With the amazing head teacher of Alston Moor Federation, Jill Jackson, I secured funding from the council to get her students to college and pressed the council for a half million pound bursary scheme to extend youth travel more widely. But we shouldn't have to do this. To secure equality of opportunity and true levelling up, will the Prime Minister look to mandate and support councils to provide post-16 transport so all our young people in towns, cities and rural areas can reach their next stage in life? My, uh, my honourable friend and the head teacher of uh, Alston Moore Federation, Jill Jackson, have done a fantastic job in securing more funding, and I wish her well also, I believe, on her upcoming retirement. As he knows, our, our school travel policy ensures that no child is prevented from accessing education by lack of transport. Not only do we have home-to-school travel policies, but the 16 to 19 bursary fund 
can be used to support young people with transport costs and more generally we're taking action to keep bus fares capped at two pounds mr speaker but i'll happily uh, make sure that the my honourable friend gets a meeting with the relevant minister to discuss his proposals further Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister will be aware of unionist concerns about uh, the need to remove the Irish Sea border created by the protocol, and that disrupts the UK's internal market. Will the Prime Minister bring forward legislation to amend the UK Internal Market Act and both guarantee and future-proof Northern Ireland's unfettered access to the UK's internal market in all scenarios? Can I thank my right honourable friend? Uh, I recognise the need to do more in this area, and I can confirm to him that the government does stand ready to legislate to protect Northern Ireland's integral place in the United Kingdom and the UK internal market, alongside an agreement to restore the executive. We can do this at pace, and I know my right honourable friend and his colleagues are working hard to achieve that. Our NHS, our police officers, and the most vulnerable in Northern Ireland need devolved government urgently, and I think it's incumbent on all of us to work day and night to help achieve that. Mr Luke Evans. 121 MPs from across the House signed my open letter to supermarkets asking to have a Buy British button online. I'm pleased to announce that last week Morrisons were the first supermarket to implement a Buy British tab. That gives consumers the choice to have homegrown produce and also supports our farmers. So will the Prime Minister join Michaels to ask other supermarkets to have the courage to make the change and follow suit? Well, Mr Speaker, this Government will always back our farmers, and I welcome the work of my honourable friend and the National Farmers Union on this particular issue. Uh, we absolutely support calls for industry-led action on this topic. I welcome the news about the Buy British Button, uh, Buy British Button at Morrison's, uh, and I can tell my honourable friend that we will continue to encourage all retailers to do all they can to showcase the incredible food produced right here in the United Kingdom. Stephen Timms. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the marriage plans of thousands of couples were dashed last week by the sudden announcement of a big increase in the salary requirement for a spouse visa. Can the Prime Minister give any reassurance to those with very well advanced marriage plans which appear now to have been scuppered and to families already in the UK who need to extend their stay who won't comply with the new rules? Can he at least offer some transitional help for families, or does his party's support for the family now only apply to the highly paid? Well, Mr Speaker, we have a long-standing principle that anyone bringing dependents to the UK must be able to support them financially. We should not expect this to be at the taxpayers' expense, and the threshold hasn't been raised in over a decade. It's right that we have now brought it in line with the median salary. Uh, the family immigration route, as he knows, does contain provision for exceptional circumstances, but more generally, it's also right, and I can tell him, to look at transitional arrangements to ensure that they are fair, and the Home Office are are actively looking at this and will set out further information shortly. Holly Mumbycroft. Thank you, Mr. Yeah, Speaker. Yeah, and I make yeah. no apology for raising once again the issue of steel. As yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, we are at serious risk now of losing the ability to make virgin steel here in the UK. I know the government are working hard on this, but it is a matter of national security, and we need the Prime Minister's leadership on this issue. What is he doing to ensure that we are able to make our own virgin steel and we don't lose it under his watch? Uh, Mr Speaker, can I praise my honourable friend's leadership for championing her local community but also the steel industry in the UK? And she's right to do so because it is an incredibly important part, not just of our local communities, but of our economy and security. And she is right to put this issue on the agenda. We are committed to working with the steel sector to secure a decarbonised future, supporting local economic growth and our levelling up agenda. That includes our commitment for major support with energy costs, but also access to hundreds of million pounds of grants to support energy efficiency and decarbonisation. I obviously can't comment on conversations with individual companies, but she can see our track record in working with either Celsa or Tata Steel that we have been able to support our fantastic steel industry and will always continue to do so. Uh, Smith. Thank you, Mr Speaker. 
A rogue company has walked away from 13,000 tonnes of hazardous waste in Lancaster and it's now been on fire for 10 days. There are plumes of smoke covering our city. Lancaster City Council has been left to pick up the tab and to date they've spent £262,000. Without government support and intervention, this fire will burn for several months. So will the Prime Minister support my local council with swift government support? Yeah. Yeah. Can I thank the Honourable Member for raising this incredibly important question? I know she's been working alongside my Honourable Friend, the Member, for Morecambe on this. Um, and can I also thank the emergency services in her constituency? And my understanding is that Lancaster City Council, the Environment Agency, and the UK HSA and emergency services are working together to ensure that the health risks and environmental consequences are minimised. But I will un uh, ensure that the relevant minister understands the absolute urgency of the issue that she's raised, and I'll make sure that she meets with them as soon as possible. Jerome May. Mr Speaker, some dental practices are taking advantage of post-COVID demand to take their <coughs> NHS practices private, earning more money but leaving behind those most in need. Training a dentist costs constituents in Broadland more than £300,000. Does my right honourable friend agree with me that if a dentist accepts public funding in order to qualify, they should be asked to commit to NHS dentistry for a number of years Absolutely. before going private? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, my honourable friend makes an excellent point, and we are investing £3 billion into dentistry. The dentistry contract with the NHS was reformed last year to improve access for patients, uh, and over or around half of all treatment were delivered to non-paying adults and children. The number of adults has seen has gone up by 10 per cent, the number of children by 15 per cent. But my honourable friend is right, and more needs to be done, and that's why the government will be bringing forward the dentistry recovery plan in due course. Well, I should have called Nova. Thank you, Mr Speaker. There are 12, day, 12 days until Christmas, and hundreds of families in Battersea will be worried. Not about being able to buy gifts for children, but whether they can afford food and heat for their homes due to the Tories' cost of living crisis. Yeah. Over 4,300 emergency food supplies were provided in Battersea by the Wandsworth Food Bank this year, and they have told me that they are bracing for the worst winter yet. Yeah. So what is the Prime Minister doing to ensure families do not go cold and hungry this Christmas? Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, we care deeply about making sure those who are most vulnerable in our society get the support that they need through the winter. That's why we increased welfare by record amounts earlier this year. We supplemented that with cost of living payments of £900 for the most vulnerable. It's why we supported those with energy bills who need our help the most. Pensioners in her constituency and elsewhere will receive up to £300 alongside their winter fuel payment. Uh, and indeed, that support lasts not just through the winter but into next year because we're deeply committed to helping those who need it. And this government has got a track record of delivering that help. Yeah. Thank, thank, you, thank you, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister is rightly focused on taking long-term decisions to improve the lives of people in this country. So can I make a suggestion? Our mental health legislation is 40 years old, and we made a manifesto commitment in 2017 and 2019 to reform the Mental Health Act because we have people with learning disabilities and autism sectioned under the Act being kept an inappropriate accommodation for long periods. We have people sectioned under that Act not receiving the compassionate care that they deserve and, in a sense, are criminalised. And we have people sectioned under that Act who um, are, have their mental health condition re-stigmatised by the Act of sectioning. So, would the Prime Minister, in the absence of a bill in the King's speech, would the Prime Minister agree to meet with me and other like-minded colleagues to discuss how we might be able to take forward reform of the Mental Health Act because it simply isn't fit for the 21st century? Well, can I thank my honourable friend for raising this important issue? Um, he's absolutely right uh, about the work that needs to be done, and I'm grateful to the Joint Committee on the Draft Mental Health Bill. And our intention is, uh, when parliamentary time allows, to bring forward uh, a bill. I'd be happy to meet with him and colleagues to discuss this, uh, but also just remind everyone that we are undertaking the largest expansion of mental health services in a generation—£2.3 billion of extra.
extra funding by March of next year, increasing capital investment in mental health urgent care centres, and under the long-term workforce plan, the largest expansion of the mental health workforce that we've ever seen in this country. Spell that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Rather than the headline chaos of his, a government that is dominating the media, much more important to the public, business, and organisations is their deeply unsatisfactory day-to-day -day experience in engaging with this dysfunctional administration. As far as they can see, Britain isn't working. When's he going to get a grip? Mr Speaker, the most pressing issue facing families is the cost of living, which is why this government has delivered what it said, which was to halve inflation. Mr. Speaker. Not just that, we are supplementing that with significant tax cuts, benefiting working families from January, £450 for a typical person in work, demonstrating that we are absolutely on the side of hard-working families, and this government is cutting their taxes. Yeah. 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 Mr Speaker, breast cancer survival rates have improved, but we need to go further on harder to reach cancers. There is a drop in in Parliament this afternoon on lobular breast cancer and the research we need. Could my right honourable friend or his excellent new Secretary of State for Health find time in their busy chart diaries to join us? Well, can I thank my right honourable friend for the work that he does on this specific and important issue? Uh, I'm happy to tell him the Health Secretary, I believe, is attending this afternoon's event to hear more about its work. And I can assure him that we're focused on fighting cancer on all fronts prevention, diagnosis, treatment, research, and funding. We are making good progress, but there's always more we can do. And I look forward to hearing from him after this afternoon's event. Thank you, Mr Speaker. While Home Secretary was in Rwanda signing his new treaty, his department put out a contract to manage small boat arrivals until 2030 at a £700 million wow. cost wow. to the taxpayer. Wow. Doesn't this show that even the Home Office doesn't think the Minister's plan will work? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, I said, uh, total mischaracterisation, Mr Speaker, uh, of what was put out, which was an advert, uh, not a commitment. But what I can say to the Honourable Lady, I'm, I'm glad that she now cares about this issue, not something that we've seen previously from the side opposite, but our track record is clear. We've got the numbers of small boat arrivals down this year by over a third, Mr Speaker. That's what we're doing about it, the party opposite voting against every measure that we've taken. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I chair the caucus of 38 Conservative members of Parliament who have Britain's longest river flowing through their constituencies, and we presented the business case to the Chancellor for £500 million to try to manage this river holistically. Our constituencies are now facing flooding every year with the damage that causes our businesses and our communities. And this evening, I have an adjournment debate on flooding of the River Severn. Will the Prime Minister take an interest because the business case shows a GVA uplift for the West Midlands of over £100 billion if we can manage and tame Britain's longest river? Yeah, yeah. Can I, uh, can I thank my honourable friend for raising this? I do recall he and I spoke about this when I was Chancellor, and I praise him for the work and his leadership on this issue in his local area. Uh, I will be ensure, I'll make sure the Chancellor does look at the business case, and he will know that we have a significantly inc increased funding for flood defences to over £5 billion, protecting hundreds of thousands more homes. But if this is an interesting opportunity for the Chancellor to look at it, I'm sure he'll take that up. Christopher Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, what's worse? Uh, losing your WhatsApp messages as a tech pro, losing £11.8 billion to fraud as Chancellor, presiding over the biggest fall in living standards in our history, or desperately clinging on to power when you become even more unpopular than Boris Johnson? <laughs> Mr. Mr. Speaker, what matters to me is delivering for the British people, and that's exactly what we're doing. Why not Jim Theresa Villiers? Given the appalling reports of sexual violence committed by Hamas on the 7th of October and the risk that hostages could be, have this treatment inflicted on them as well. Will he raise this issue in international fora so the international community demands strongly humanitarian access to hostages in Gaza? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Mr Speaker, the reports of sexual violence 
perpetrated by Hamas are deeply shocking. We've raised our concerns with the United Nations uh, a fortnight or so ago, and we are engaging with the Israeli government to consider what further support we can take. And more broadly, we continue to do everything that we can to ensure that all hostages can return safely to their families, including those British hostages and those with links to the UK. And she can rest assured that I and the Foreign Secretary are working tirelessly to bring about their safe return. A complete Prime Minister's questions. That brings us to the end of the final uh, Prime Minister's questions for this session before the Christmas recess. Let's welcome our guests for this part of Politics Live. For the Government, the Conservative Party Chairman, Richard Holden, and the Shadow Health Secretary, Wes Streeting for Labour. Welcome to you. And the BBC's Deputy Political Editor, uh, Vicky Young. Let's start with you, Vicky. There was a slight sense of end-of-term feel, perhaps even panto-ish, um, from some of the exchanges across the dispatch box, and a much more buoyed... Prime Minister uh, in Rishi Sunak than he has been for the last few weeks. And I suppose that's unsurprising because he got his Rwanda plan through second reading. Uh, of course, the phrase that's banded about is he's all right for now. Yeah, but I think he'll take that, won't he, given mm. where he was. Uh, and I think actually that was maybe part of the background. It, 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 it did feel a bit of a strange Prime Minister's questions. Uh, and I think, you know, the attack from uh, Sir Keir Starmer with those anonymous quotes from Tory MPs, uh, although they were, you know, pretty powerful, actually the fact that the government won with the majority of 44 yesterday uh, allowed Rishi Sunak to sort of really push that aside uh, to some extent. Uh, and I think, you know, they're, as you say, they're a bit of an end of term feel. I mean, maybe the most significant thing we heard was just a you know one question there from um, uh, Jeremy Donaldson uh, about the uh, Stormont and the idea that there will be some legislation coming forward mm. potentially if Stormont is up and running so it could end up being that that is maybe the most significant thing and something coming in the new year. All right well welcome to both of you. Richard Holden let's start with you as uh, we've just explained the government won uh, that vote on second reading when MPs debate the main principles of legislation and it is a flagship bill uh, for the government. We had your colleague Miriam Cates who is one of the five families as it's been talked about in fact the uh, Prime Minister referenced it um, lots of families within the Tory party as he said. What did you promise or what was promised to Miriam Cates and her colleagues to get the uh, legislation through and for them just to abstain? Well, I think what we saw yesterday was uh, sense prevailing across uh, all the Conservative Party, realising we're united behind a, a desire to uh, really get to grips with illegal immigration. We've already taken some really sensible steps, whether that's returning 22,000 people this year who've got no right to be in the UK, a new deal with Albania, a new deal on intelligence sharing with uh, Turkey as well to help deal with some of those sure. upstream gangs. But what did you, but what did you promise UK? Miriam Cates? We had a discussion with her and she was absolutely clear there have to be changes. There have have to be changes to this Rwanda plan or they will vote it down. The, the government has been very clear that if there are uh, tweaks which can be uh, made, oh, which uh, both do two things. First of all, uh, ensure that the government of Rwanda can uh, still uh, take part in it and also that they are obviously legally sound, that they'd happily look at those. But the key thing here is, I think what we saw yesterday was the entire... Con no, no Conservative MP uh, voted against uh, the plans. No. Uh, the Labour Party uh, did en masse. Uh, and it's quite clear that you know they've voted against over 60 things we've tried to do now. Sure. Some of, some of which we've already talked about. Yes. But it's uh, going to know, hit... To it's going to hit... It. it is going to hit the rocks, isn't it, this legislation, if... Uh, as Miriam Cates has warned, you don't make significant changes to reduce further any potential legal challenges um, early next year. So I say again, what was promised, if anything, to Miriam Cates? I, I, all, all, I, I think it's just exactly what I've said is that obviously if there are tweaks which people can come forward with, which allow us to still obviously have that deal with Rwanda, but also within uh, the legal regulations, then uh, that's what's there. Look, I think actually uh, what happened is um, people uh, saw sense. They want to back us on dealing with illeg illegal migration. They see the threat, uh, Conservative MPs, from what would happen if uh, Sir Keir Starmer was in well, power, because obviously Labour have opposed well, every I'll come, single measure I'll we've come tried on to, to, Labour. to stop I'll, illegal migration. I'll come on to Labour in so just think, a moment. I think that's the focus that actually MPs had yesterday. Well, no, I know it's the focus you want to have, but the focus, just, just for the moment, and we'll, 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 we'll come on to West Streeting, because there is a difference, it seems, uh, between what Rishi Sunak said in private to Miriam Cates and uh, her colleagues within that new Conservative group of MPs and what he was saying in public, um, which is what we heard from the Prime Minister earlier in the week. Let's have a listen. It is the only approach. 
because going any further, that difference is an inch, but going any further would mean that Rwanda will collapse the scheme and then we will have nowhere to send anyone to. And that is not a way to get this going. So just to clarify, that is still government policy, not moving an inch because it will collapse the deal that the Rwandans have signed up to. Is that still policy? The Prime Minister is very clear there. Yeah. Obviously, right. we have to have a situation in which the, the, the deal is able to be done by Rwanda. I've, the, these are the points I've just made twice already, but I'll do them again. Uh, the, the Rwanda, whatever happens, if yeah. there are tweaks that can be made, right. they have but to be in a situation tweaks. where right. Rwanda can still accept the deal and they have to be legally what? sound. Right. Exactly What's your plan situation. to stop the boats, Wes? Well, we would take the money that's currently being squandered hand over fist, already mm. over £200 million, pounds, could mm. go as high as £400 million pounds at this rate, and put that into the National Crime Agency to deal with the problem at source, which are these criminal gangs that are trafficking people yeah. around the continent, well. exploiting people, and as well as giving the National Crime Agency the resources to do the job, also the powers to do the job. One of the, um, one of the things Keir Starmer was talking about this week was using the powers that we currently use to tackle terrorism and taking that right. same set of powers and approach to tackling criminal gangs. Will that stop the boats, though? Because Keir Starmer, uh, the Labour leader, when he was giving his speech in response to questions, said he hoped that that would stop the boats, but he wasn't completely uh, sure. Um, and uh, the response from the National Crime Agency, we may be able to show you the headline, uh, where it says, stopping channel migrants not possible without Rwanda-style scheme. Um, there it is there. Efforts to deter people arriving in small boats doomed to fail without some sort of deportation threat, say law enforcement well, sources. Two things. We've, we've got to work with our international allies as well to stop the well, they're, people they're, coming they're over. Doing that, the second, they, the second thing I'd say is in terms of the process of people and their claims, we've got to get that speeded up and we've got to deport people faster where their applications ah. are unsuccessful. That, that's not happening. And in terms of the criminal gangs, by the way, prosecutions have fallen in the last year of these criminal gangs. So we're moving backwards, not forward. And, and, and OK, maybe Labour's approach is not quite as headline-grabbing as the Rwanda scheme, although looking at today's head, headlines... Well, the implication of the National Crime headlines. Agency says it won't work without that sort of deterrent. Well, I think that's why you've got to, you've got to make sure that where people's claims are unsuccessful, that they are deported but and how, that people can see that as happening right. and happening But faster. where are you going to deport people who've come from countries that you can't send them back to, like Afghanistan or Iran? Um, you say if they're unsuccessful, wh wh where would you well, send them? Well, at the moment, them? people are just meandering around government doesn't even know how many of these people are still meandering around you've got to, you've got to speed up the processing as I say it's not quite as headline grabbing as the Rwanda policy but I think it is a, a process that would actually work in practice and and what matters is what works right the reason why people are so distressed is because they can see that um, well, not just um, illegal migration, sure. but legal migration, the system is broken too. Well, we've got we'll, to get that. We'll concentrate, to get that we'll concentrate on the illegal. Process. The reason I'm questioning you, um, even though you are not in government, is that you could inherit uh, this problem. And as you say, it is a sizable problem. And the National Crime Agency has said that even if you did uh, make progress on smashing some of the people smuggler rings, that in the end, more will just replace them. It's almost an impossible task to smash those rings completely. I think what lots of us are struggling with is the idea that we will have already spent more than £200 million without a single flight having taken off, apart from the ones carrying Home Secretaries with suitcases full of cash for Rwanda for nothing in return. And at the same time, you know, let's assume they do get this scheme up and running. Mm. Let's assume it happens. Then we'll be deporting, what, 100 people a year to Rwanda? A 1,000 arrived last week. I mean... So a tenth of one week's of arrivals being deported to Rwanda at a cost of hundreds of millions of pounds. Mm. It's ineffective and it's wasteful. Well, Richard, I mean, all of that is true, isn't well, it, in terms just, of the money well, I spent? I just want to, just to pick up on a few of the things Wes said. I mean, obviously, uh, it does feel a little bit like Keir Starmer's taken a leaf out of his uh, Shadow Chancellor's book by basically copying and pasting our plans. They want to do more international stuff. Obviously, we're working with Turkey to tackle those gangs upstream. They want to do more deals on dep deportations. Obviously, we've already done that with Albania. They want to increase the police presence in the UK to try and tackle these gangs. That's up by 70%. Mm -hmm. He says he wants more deportations, but we know that uh, Keir Starmer's already writing letters to uh, stop people being deported who've 
already been convicted of serious criminal offences here in the UK, alongside dozens of other Labour MPs. So I think it's quite difficult to take that at face value, especially when it's quite clear that Labour continue to oppose everything we've done. And as the head of the National Crime Agency has said, without some form of Rwanda-style deal, we cannot get this down. And the key, th the key thing behind that is actually the deterrent factor. Right. We have to ensure that anybody who comes to the UK illegally cannot stay in the UK. Well, and that's well, what's where's, fundamental. Well, let Wes respond then to that. But the Permanent Secretary of the Home Office has said there's no evidence that this is going to have a deterrent effect. So well, I think... National I think, Crime Agency has. I think, well, well, I mean, look, not for the first time, government doesn't appear very joined up. Um, and, you know, in the spirit of you know, Christmas, Joe, I would have been quite happy to I have mean, another four Conservative MPs sat alongside finish, Richard so we could have heard from all the different perspectives of the I mean, Conservative West, West Party. Wes says we wants to back deportations, but Labour have never voted for it in, oh, or, 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 or some on. form of Rwanda-style scheme, but no, they've never voted for it in Parliament. Right. Do you actually think it's going to get through? Will you keep the... Uh, I'm, I'm, so I'm, I'm, what, what are you we, going what, to what present we, that's going to keep both Miriam Cates and Matt Warman, whom we also had on before from the One Nation group. What's going to, what's going to bring all them together? All we've seen is all, all conserv no Conservative MP oppose what we've done to date. Uh, we've already put through yeah. significant this is, legislation this is such a low in this bar. place. I, mean, I, mean, I admire the fact you said no, it was no, straight I mean, you, I know you were opposed to this. But this is such a low bar. You, you, you I mean, you, you should have, Richard, you let let Wesley, you should have seen it yesterday. Like, the spectacle in Parliament of Tory MPs holding impromptu press huddles all over the estate all day. And then when their government, with an 80 majority, gets a bill through mm. with half of that majority, mm. honestly, you'd have thought they'd just won the lottery, sort of patting themselves on the back. And let's assume, Richard, that you do get the bill through and it's a success. A hundred people a year for hundreds of millions of pounds mm. out of taxpayers' pockets <laughs> that they could probably the do better with in themselves. The this is, in the fairness, this is at the a joke. we're spending eleven billion pounds because this uh, on to deal with the people who've come across in small boats a year. Right, this is well, a small price to pay if that deterrent effect. Well, could, I, if, it, if it actually stops people coming to the sure, UK. But and Richard, the, the truth is, there's no answers from Labour on well, this. Hang on. All I they just will told you what no, our answers no, are. Your, your answers are just copy and paste, poor versions of what we've already put forward. Yes, but you've just said. Just to pick up on that, you said that that's working. The, 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 arrange the arrangement with Al yeah, the arrangement with Albania. Ninety percent, ninety percent arrivals down right. from Albania. So this why year. don't you use the money? A suggestion in terms of copying and pasting uh, of Labour's uh, position, which is use the money that you spent on Rwanda on law enforcement. If it's working, we, we already, if we Albania are, we, and the deal with France is we working are, we already, so well, we already, are, use we, that we, we already are spending. We've already increased that by seventy percent. Yeah, but you're saying that works. What, what we need to find, what we need to find, as the head of the National Crime Agency said, yeah. is proper routes, because without some form of uh, ability to deport people, to, like a Rwanda style scheme, oh. as he said, mm. right, you cannot get that deterrent in place, and Labour have no answer to that. Right. They've opposed I... every single piece of legislation we've done to try and t crack down on illegal migrants. The House is going to go in the new year, because as we have said, maybe cryptically, um, Rishi Sunak has got his bill through for now, because what's going to happen in the new year? Well, then it goes through those stages, the detailed stages, and this is where trouble could come for the government. Now, I think it was interesting there, talking about tweaks. Tweaks mm. are not going to be enough to please some of those people, including people like Miriam Cates and Marc Francois. So, but, of course, the problem is on the other side, you've actually got a large number of Conservative MPs who do not want this to go any further. Uh, and they feel that they've also had reassurances that it isn't going to, going to go any further in terms of our international legal uh, obligations. Now, uh, do the group with Mark Francois have the numbers? I'm not entirely sure they do. Uh, I think that's why the government's maybe feeling a bit more buoyant, because I think looking at those numbers, I'm not sure they do have enough to defeat it, even at a later stage. But I think the frustration you hear from cabinet ministers and others is that this is obviously taking all the headlines because it's been you know, rejected by the Supreme Court because it's causing these battles in Parliament. All the attention is on the Rwanda policy and because, of course, it's controversial and it isn't on the other things that maybe are working. All right, let's talk um, about the NHS um, because we have the Shadow Health Secretary who gave quite a talking of headline uh, grabbing interview at uh, the weekend um, in the Sunday Times. We've got the headline here, we're streeting. NHS uses every winter crisis as an excuse for cash. Britain's medical chiefs must accept that money is tight, says the Shadow Health Secretary, and they can learn lessons from Singapore's high-tech hospitals. You have been there, in fact, looking at the model there and in other countries. We're joined also by Dr Helen Salisbury, who is a GP in Oxford and joins us from her surgery. Welcome to you, Helen. I'll come to you in just a moment. But do, do you stand by that, uh, those words, those comments? NHS uses winter crisis as an excuse for cash. Yeah, what I'm really anxious about at the moment is this assumption that 
if there's a change of government after the next general election, a Labour government comes in and turns on the taps and there'll just be more money in the system. Now, we have made some specific, fully costed, fully funded uh, commitments to in provide two million more appointments a year to cut waiting lists, to put mental health support in every primary and secondary school, uh, to put mental health hubs in every community, to double the number of diagnostic centres. So there, there, there will be some money. How much, my anxiety, how much, how much, my... Just, just briefly, how much in total, in money terms, are you saying you're going to put into the NHS? Well, in terms of the commitments we've made so far, we've got £1.6 billion, mm -hmm. which funds the uh, appointments, okay. the scanners yeah. and the 700,000 extra dentistry appointments, yeah. and a, a just under a billion pounds for the mental health package. So both are, both yeah. are fully costed, fully sure, funded. Fully costed, but it's a drop in the ocean in terms of the NHS. But here's, budget, but here's, the, here's the problem, Joe, and we've just got to be really clear about this. The public finances are in an absolute state, the, uh, thanks to this lot, and recovering from that is going to take time. In addition, even if, um, for argument's sake, Rachel Reeves had a complete personality transplant <laughs> and became a big spending chancellor, I turned on the tap. There's, you know, uh, you're pouring more money into a system oh. that is fundamentally okay. not spending money in the right ways in the right places. For example, because there are thousands fewer GPs than there were a few years ago, despite the fact GPs are providing a million more appointments now than they were during the pandemic, people can't get GP appointment, All right. which will cost £40. So they All end right. up in A&E, which costs £400. So it's those sorts of issues yep. that we need to deal with, All making right, sure me... the NHS is spending the money it already has wisely let me get, before let me... we get into the conversation Well, let me get Dr Helen money. Salisbury in. Uh, listening to Wes Streeting, what do you make of what he says and his assessment of the NHS in terms of wasting money? Oh, where to start? I think, first of all, he needs to apologise for that headline. It probably wasn't his headline, but I think many doctors found it very offensive, the idea that we're using something as an excuse. There is a crisis in the health service. Uh, he had a lovely time in Singapore, but I bet he didn't see any buckets under leaking roofs or ambulances queuing up. OK, so we do need resources. He's talking about a drop in the ocean. Um, it, well, you talked about yes, a drop in the ocean, what we need. We, we know from um, uh, the academic analysis, from King's Fund, from Health Foundation, that we're about 40 billion a year below the spend of our nearest neighbours in terms of what we're spending on healthcare. So we're, we're doing it on the cheap and we're not getting what we need. All right, well, let, and, me, get where, I, let me get Wes to respond to that and then I'll come back to you, Helen. Yeah, I mean, for the first thing... Do you I, want to apologise? Yeah, well, the first thing I'd say, Helen... At no point in that interview did I or would I criticise the staff of the NHS, you, your colleagues in primary care, colleagues in hospitals. Like of, the, of the many things that I find depressing and worrying about the NHS, the one thing that I think gives me optimism and hope about the NHS and its future are the people working in it and the people who are doing some really inspiring things every day against this really bleak and challenging backdrop. So I don't think it's the case that you or nurses or doctors elsewhere in the health service Service, are you know using the winter crisis to get more money out of government? My anxiety is that the system, uh, the system, demands more money at a time when it's scarce. And what I'm deeply anxious about is that people start making the assumptions and the plans that if there's a Labour government, there's just inevitably lots more money comes in All right, when well. the public finances are a mess. And I want people to think about how we can spend the money that's already going in. Um, to better effect. Well, would you agree with that? that? You're right. Challenges. There are ways we oh. can spend the, the money better. You're right that we should be maybe redistributing more to um, to GPs because we know that money spent there prevents money needing to be spent elsewhere, but it takes time. time. But in fact, general practice has a very small amount. We know that continuity of care really makes a difference. If you can see your own doctor, so I'm really pleased to see that emphasis on having a family doctor. That really helps. There's a few places where we're wasting money. There's this yep. massive contract just gone for data handling to a company that nobody trusts and nobody knows whether it'll work and it's really poorly specified. That needs to be looked at. But on the whole, actually the NHS is surprisingly efficient, is very mm. efficient. They're, they're just there just aren't enough doctors, there aren't enough nurses, and the premises are falling apart. Right, OK, surprisingly efficient, says Helen. And actually, when it comes to funding, the King's Fund published a report in October on NHS funding that said, in comparison uh, to similar countries, France and Germany, the UK has below average health spending per person, has done for quite a long time, and low levels of key clinical staff, which is what Helen is talking about. 
So it does need more cash, doesn't it? Well, the, 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 there is a fundamental fact we will have to deal with if we win the next election, which is the scarcity of resources. And I, I strongly support what Helen was saying about the need to shift the centre of gravity of the NHS out of the hospital into the community, doing more with and through primary care, through general mm. practice. We're committed to that. Mm. And for example, you know, on, on continuity of care, what we will do is reduce the number of measures that GPs are judged by and funded mm. by but and divert that money into continuity of care. Disagree? So that's a good example yeah, of you, spending money that's you, already going to be But Helen is saying she thinks it is rather efficient um, and quite lean in that sense. You think there's waste and inefficiency. Where is it? Because, well, I mean, I gave a really, a really practical example of that because people can't get a GP appointment, they end up in A&E, which is worse for them as a patient, but also more expensive for the taxpayer. Instead of £40 for a GP appointment, it's £400 for an A&E attendance, but which is why, you know, by adopting a neighbourhood health centre yeah. approach, by doing more diagnostics in yeah. the community, well, actually, having a wider range a, of roles in the community... Well, Helen, we you re do well, let Helen respond. Situation. We've got a situation where there are actually now GPs who can't get employment because the GP practices can't afford to employ them. I mean, it's ridiculous. We've got all sorts of bonkers. other people in primary care, but, but there are GPs who are now not being able to work because yeah, they just, can't find anyone who can afford. And that's really because and my other the project, my other point, Wes, is to come back. You said there isn't any money and our productivity needs to go up. We need to, you know, if you want a productive society, you're really going to have to invest in healthcare, Health. you're mm. going to have to invest in social care and in childcare because those are the things that are going to get people healthy and back to work. We've got so many sick people. We are the sick person of Europe. Yeah, I, and that's I, partly I, because I, we don't, haven't spent on our health care. Yeah, I, 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 I agree with that point, Helen. I think as well as shifting out of hospital into the community, the other thing we need to do is tackle the social determinants of ill health. So much what determines our healthy life expectancy, so much of what would keep us well and avoid us having to go into the NHS are entirely outside. It's things like, you know, housing, employment, good education, poverty reduction. And my anxiety is we already spend more than 40% of day-to-day -day government spending on the NHS. When resources are tight, every penny that we spend on that is a penny that we might have spent on child poverty reduction or on um, housing or on other things that also affect the social determinants. So the point I'm trying to make to the NHS as a system is when resources are scarce it's even more important that we make sure we're spending the money in the right ways and in the right places. Right. I do think there are big savings to be made on things like procurement. I do think there are big savings to be made by spending money differently within the system and I think GPs and primary care will be a big beneficiary well, of that approach and we've got to work together because one person, one government can't solve all these problems. Oh. We need to mobilise the well, whole in... system to work together, which is why we'll have a serious 10-year well, plan to achieve the sort of shifts that you and I both want to see. Well, that does sound like a long-term plan, and there are many people who want to be treated now because of the record waiting lists that have developed under your government and 13 years of Conservative uh, government. Obviously, the pandemic happened um, a few years ago, and that has exacerbated the crisis. But why is it, after 13 years of Conservative government, Richard, that we do have below average health spending per person compared to many other countries. I mentioned France and Germany, there's also the Netherlands, Belgium, Sweden. Why? Well, I think Wes touched on a very important point here. You know, my mum actually works as a ward clerk in an NHS hospital and there's clearly a lot of efficiencies uh, that can potentially be made in all sorts of things, particularly around uh, patient records and things like that. And uh, I actually hope that on a, on, a, on a broad level, both parties have basically backed the NHS since its creation. Yeah. Uh, and I hope that actually yeah. it, that we continue to and the so answer to my question on no, below average spending? No, but, 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 you know, 40%, as Wes said, of, of government, over 40% is on the NHS. We're spending record sums on the NHS today. Uh, and but it's still and less per person than many other I, countries. And you're, you're right. But, and, and as Wes says, you know, that is, there is limited resources uh, of, of what... You know, but we are spending more per head than ever uh, before. But I mean, you know, you're spending but you... more and getting less, aren't you? Because we've got you know, longer waiting lists, longer waiting times, lower patient satisfaction. I would just say... I would just say cancer, cancer care is worse just, every year I would since just, I would just say, look, you, you know, Labour and Keir Starmer have said that the Welsh Labour government is a blueprint for what should happen in the rest of the UK. Per head, waiting lists are significantly higher. There's much longer waiting lists uh, over, over two years as well. There's virtually none of that in England, but there is in Labour-run Wales. I don't... I actually don't think the NHS should be a real 
party political knockabout, I think we should all want to see good things happening in the future. I think one thing I hope we can both agree on is the a 2.4 billion for the long-term NHS a workforce plan. I want to see more doctors and nurses coming through in that. Well, we Not having to say people from overseas as oh, well. well we but I think, I think there's things can we can agree on. But I would like to see yes. us working together. Yeah, um, and Helen, I'm going to come to you briefly just before the end of the programme, and you can chip in, but just on this issue of the NHS, I mean, obviously these are not decisions that West Streeting is making at the moment, um, but could be uh, if it becomes Health Secretary. How important and crucial is the is the issue of cash and money going to be? It is, and I think, you know, for all the talk, we've talked a lot about immigration, it's an important issue to some, but I think that things like this are possibly more important to people because they can see, and no matter what you, how you talk about record amounts going in, um, people don't think it's improving, they think it's getting worse. Mm, no uh, and the knock-on effects of people on waiting lists who are too sick to work, you know, the government is well aware of this. How you turn it around quickly, though, is, is the big issue. Helen, we've only got about 30, 45 seconds, please, on the workforce plan. On the workforce plan, we were delighted to see it, but it's really, really lacking because if we're going to train some more doctors, we need to not just get them so they qualify, we need to do more training programmes. But there's a lot qualifying and then going elsewhere because there is no further training and they can't complete, they can't get to be consultants. So that's a mess. And they're leaving because they're not paid enough. They're paid vastly ah. less. They're paid less than the physician's associates. It's a disaster. And so lots of people aren't staying. So there's no point training loads more doctors if they then just leave. Right. Well, Dr Helen Salisbury, thank you very much for joining us. And I'm afraid we're going to finish briefly. Uh, we won't show you the headline, but junior doctors are striking for three days, of course, before the Christmas holidays. But that is all we have time for today. Thank you very much uh, for my guest here in the studio it is the final uh, Prime Minister's question for this session. But I'll be back tomorrow at 12.15 with more Politics Live. Bye bye. Spectacular wonders.